Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Music of the Pilgrims with Seven Times Salt. I'm Catherine Alger. I'm the president here at the NHS, and I want to welcome all of you. Uh, for those of you who are brand new uh, and don't know about us, we are the first historical society in the nation. Uh, the heart of our enterprise is our fabulous collection, which we began assembling in 1791 and continues today. We have 14 million items, pieces of the past, art, artifacts, but mostly manuscripts and stories of people's lives. And the joy of our job is to connect as many people and as many kinds of people to this fabulous resource as possible. Um, and we do most everything we do, including public programs like this one for free. So um, we do encourage you to support us. And I want to tell you about something special. So do get to know our website. So we're at masshist.org and you'll see the, a little, uh, um, little Chiron about that. Uh, and there's so many great things there. Uh, yes, there is a part where you click on and say support and you can give us a donation or become a member, but there's all kinds of interesting stuff. And we uh, debuted yesterday our very first all virtual exhibition and it couldn't be more timely. It's called Who Counts? And it's a history of voting rights through political cartoons. And I'd also like to alert you to what I think is gonna be the hottest ticket in town. We are also doing our very first all virtual gala and it will be November 17th. It will be done on Zoom. And we have as our guest, John Meacham, the author of um, Soul, Soul of America and his new book on John Lewis and he'll be in conversation with Emily Rooney. And I have to tell you, if you think about that date and what happens or about two weeks before that, I can promise you it's gonna be a freewheeling and fun conversation. So if you do masthist.org backslash gala, um, there's information and places to buy tickets. But we, what we have tonight is pretty special, pilgrims and music. So I'm gonna turn the rest of the program over to Gavin. Gavin? Uh, we have a special event this evening, uh, which is our first musical Zoom event, Zoom event at MHS. Uh, we will uh, explore the music of the Plymouth colonist. Uh, the, we'll explore the music that the Plymouth colonists brought with them across the Atlantic and would have heard in 17th century America. This of course includes psalms, but also music from Elizabethan taverns and theaters, spirited drinking songs and Dutch love songs. We are joined by the group Seven Times Salt, who specialize in performing in 16th and century in 16th and 17th century music. Uh, they met as conservatory students in 2013 and have been performing uh, for the past 17 years together. They have been pra praised for their creative programming. They have performed at venues throughout New England, including Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum, Plymouth Plantation, the Boston Public Library, New England Folk Festival, WGBH Radio, and many more. Uh, they encourage their listeners to smile, laugh, to tap their feet, and join the party. They delight in blurring the lines between art music and folk tunes um, and feel at ease performing in concert halls, dance halls, beer halls, or in the case of this evening program, uh, in your own house. <laughs> uh, the program will include uh, spoken history, PowerPoint slides, and music, and there will be time for questions at the end. Um, but without further ado, uh, let me turn this over. Uh, to our partners. Well, thank you, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. We are very excited to talk to all of you, even though we can't see all of you. My name is Karen, and I'm the violinist for Seven Times Salt, which is an early music group based in Boston. And today, my colleagues Dan and Matthew and I are going to take a look and a listen at music that the settlers of early Plymouth Colony might have heard, might have known, or even might have sung and played themselves. And we will follow them first from the turbulent England of the 1590s on to religious freedom in the Netherlands and then to their new lives here in New England in 1620. Years ago, I actually worked at Plymouth Plantation as a historical interpreter. So I got to wear a costume and I learned to speak and cook and garden like English people did 400 years ago. More importantly, I also got to sing. I sang catches, psalms, and part songs, and I got to dance to 17th century tunes. The experience really had an effect on me and captured my imagination. And just a few years later, as I was finishing grad school, it formed the basis of a concert program for Seven Times Salt called Pilgrim's Progress. 
Fast forward to 2018, and we were fortunate enough that year to record this um, as a, a CD um, in the historic 1717 Meeting House on Cape Cod. And uh, I'm not sure if people are aware of it, it's in West Barnstable. It is an amazing structure that's been used continuously for meetings for over 300 years. So we were very lucky to record in that historic space. And today you're going to hear excerpts from that album, which includes not only music, but also spoken word in the form of fictitious diary entries that we wrote in order to flesh out the story. On the album, we play period instruments, which are modern replicas of 16th and 17th century instruments. So this evening you'll hear the Renaissance violin and flute, the lute, the viola da gamba and voices. Um, and as a quick side note, the CD is for sale and we'll tell you more about that at the end of our presentation. So most of us learn in school that the pilgrims, as they were later called, sailed on the Mayflower in 1620, landed on Plymouth Rock, and had a Thanksgiving feast with the natives. But only some of that is true. The settlers didn't refer to themselves as the pilgrims. The story of Plymouth Rock was made up over 120 years later. And while there was a day of Thanksgiving, that word doesn't mean what you may think it means. There's much more to that story. And it's a story that actually began several decades earlier um, in an England that was a patchwork of very different beliefs and attitudes towards worship, and that sometimes saw violence as a result. By the 1590s, Queen Elizabeth I had managed a compromise between staunch Catholics, conforming Anglicans, and a variety of Protestants, including Puritans, Anabaptists, Sabbatarians, and the group that concerns our so-called pilgrims, the Separatists. Separatists viewed the Church of England with great suspicion, believing it held on to rituals of the Catholic Church that weren't called for in the Bible, and they wanted to separate themselves from the Church and worship in their own way, which was illegal. And it's important to note that Separatists were different from Puritans. Puritans wanted to purify the Church but remain part of it. Separatists actually wanted to leave, and they weren't allowed to do that. Queen Elizabeth was relatively lenient towards all of these various religious groups, but in 1603, when James VI of Scotland was crowned King of England and head of the church, he started persecuting these various religious sects that he viewed as a threat to the nation. Members of separatist congregations were fined, harassed, attacked, and even imprisoned, and families began to fear for their lives. Later on, you'll hear more about a particular group of separatists, from the village of Scrooby in the north of England and their decision to flee to Holland. However, the separatists were only half of the settlers who came to the New World in 1620. The rest of the colonists who sailed on the Mayflower were a mix of people of different backgrounds and faiths, most of them middle class, some of higher station, and a number of servants, all of whom simply wanted to advance their fortunes and profit from the wealth they thought was waiting for them in the Americas, but none of whom particularly cared about freedom of religion. For them, it was purely a business opportunity. And William Bradford later called these people strangers. Um, I also think it's worth pointing out that what a lot of us learned that the pilgrims came to America for religious freedom isn't exactly true. Um, in a few minutes, Dan will tell you more about their actual reasons for emigrating. But first, we've promised you some music. So we're going to hear some music um, to represent the separatists' uneasy time in England in the 1590s. We'll hear a little bit of Psalm 18 from the whole book of Psalms that was published in 1592. And from above the Lord sent down to fetch me from below and plucked me out of waters great that would me of my 
So apart from the singing of psalms for worship and music, uh, music making by the people was enjoyed at home and in the pub. There are collections of music that were published for these very domains in the early 17th century. A popular form of chamber music at this time was played by a consort. Now, a consort could be an ensemble of like instruments. For example, a quartet of crumb horns or a quintet of viols da gamma. Or it could be something called a broken consort. Six different but specific instruments. So in the order of how they were scored, we had a treble viol or a violin. Under that would be the flute or the recorder. Underneath would be the string section lute, the cittern, the bandora, and holding it all together at the bottom would be the bass viol da gamba. A gentleman named Thomas Morley published music for, uh, specifically for the Broken Consort in a volume called The First Book of Consort Lessons. This book could be seen as a, uh, you know, instruction manual for this brand new ensemble. Uh, an instrument like the bandora, which is that plucked bass guitar, uh, in that fo in the picture there, his back is to us. But um, that was a new instrument. That was only invented maybe 10 years prior to this publication. So what does this music have to do with the separatists? Not much. Actually, very little. But there was one settler we know named Edward Winslow. And as a youngster, this is around 1606, Winslow attended, uh, I'm sorry, Winslow attended the King's School at Worcester Cathedral. The school was founded by Henry VIII some 59 years before, and it's well documented that Henry VIII was an accomplished lutenist and a composer in his own right. So it stands to reason that uh, music would have held, would be held in high regard in the education of people, or of young people at this particular school. So let's hear an example of the Broken Consort. The following piece is entitled Bachelor's Delight. It was composed by the lut lutenist Daniel Bachelor, who was the court lutenist to Queen Anne in 1603. Here it's arranged by the before mentioned Thomas Morley from his first book of consort lessons. <laughs> mentioned that music like that doesn't have much to do with the separatists and I agree. Um, one exciting thing was we're finding music for this program is that we were able to represent the people who weren't separatists as well and that opened up a lot of other music for us. So um, in our next example we're actually going to look at something someone might have heard going to the theater. 
Um, many wonderful examples of songs from the theater tradition are referenced in the plays of William Shakespeare, and songs that might look like a simple printed text on the page were brought to life, sung and danced by the actors on stage. When we perform songs from this period, Seven Times Salt tries to use original pronunciation, or OP, to demonstrate how English probably sounded around 1600. Scholars have been researching OP for decades now, and as best they can tell, OP sounds fairly Irish, somewhat American, a little bit Cockney, and I also hear bits of Cornwall and Devon and all the amazing West Country accents that you hear in the Southwest of England. What OP is not is the sort of refined upper class British accent that we associate with classically trained actors performing Shakespeare or that we might imitate while watching The Crown or Downton Abbey. In our next example, you'll hear Matt sing this song using a little bit of this accent, which probably sounds more American than you might expect. Now, the wonderful thing about using OP is that suddenly words rhyme that don't in modern English, and suddenly puns work that don't in modern English. Here we see the text to this song, O Mistress Mine, and if you look at the first two lines, and you look at the last word of both of those lines, in modern English we have roaming and coming. They look the same, but they don't sound the same. But when you say it in original pronunciation, you get Raming and coming, which is a lot closer. And there are numerous examples of, of things like that where suddenly the words come alive in the dialect. So now we're going to hear O oh, Mistress Mine, which we envision anyone um, roaming the streets or visiting the taverns or theaters of London might have heard around the year 1605. <laughs>
So now I get to talk about the part of the Plymouth journey that not as many people are familiar with, which is the decade that about half the Plymouth colonists spent in the Netherlands before sailing for the New World. As Karen mentioned earlier, it was a tough time for religious dissenters in England, and a particular congregation based in the town of Scrooby in Nottinghamshire, led by their pastor, John Robinson, decided to flee England in 1607, bound for the religious freedom of the Netherlands. Unfortunately, King James had made it illegal for religious dissenters to leave England without permission from the crown, so they had to make a secret agreement with a merchant shipping captain to transport them to Holland. Unfortunately, he sold them out and delivered them instead to the authorities who imprisoned several members of the congregation and seized all of their property and possessions. Despite that setback, however, about 30 members of the congregation tried again a year later and this time successfully made it to Amsterdam. By early 1609, they had obtained a government charter to rent some properties in the town of Leiden. Now, Leiden was a busy cosmopolitan town of about 45,000 people in 1608. It was a far cry from the village of about 200 that the Scrooby immigrants were used to. The uh, neighborhood that they settled in was shared with Catholics, Lutherans, Belgian Huguenots, Sephardic Jews, Ottoman Muslims, and many others. And while they had no money or space to build a church, they were able to worship freely every Sunday in John Robinson's house, which became their church for the next 10 years. Now, while we don't know for sure what kind of music the separatists might have enjoyed at home in Leiden, there's no doubt that it was a great place to find music in the early 1600s, particularly printed music, because Leiden was quickly becoming the center of the Dutch printing industry at the time. So when we researched music that the Scrooby settlers might have heard while living in Holland, we generally ended up drawing from music published a few decades later during the heyday of the Leiden publishing industry, including the collection Tautnemend Cabinet, or The Useful Collection, a book of instrumental music collected for enjoyment at home by amateur players. The pieces themselves come from a variety of sources and sometimes have whimsical titles. One little uh, ditty in the collection is called Tana and Henne Krai, or The Rooster and the Cackling of the Hens. So uh, here's a little excerpt, and I think you'll hear the chickens. So there's, there's a bit of uh, 17th century Dutch chickens for you. And now here's another example of music that would have been enjoyed at home um, by the inhabitants of Leiden. Most people these days probably think of the recorder as a school instrument that kids play before moving on to more serious instruments. But in the Renaissance and Baroque eras, the recorder was a serious instrument. Um, it came in many sizes from the tiny sopranino to the seven foot tall contrabass. And it was frequently played by both amateurs and virtuosic professionals. One such professional was Jakob van Eyck, who was a blind organist and recorder player from Husten, about 100 kilometers away from Leiden. Um, as music director at the Janskirk in Utrecht, he was paid an extra stipend on top of his organist salary to sit in the church gardens in the evening and play his Handflaut, which is the size of recorder that we now call a soprano, similar to the one that you probably played in school. His repertoire consisted of popular songs, psalm tunes, and other melodies that would have been familiar to his listeners. And much like a modern jazz saxophonist, he was well known for creating virtuosic improvisations on these basic songs. Eventually, one of his students wrote down many of these improvisations, and they were published in a collection called De Flauten Lusthof, or The Flute's Pleasure Garden. Um, one of the more charming pieces in this collection is called Engels Nachtehaltia, or the English Nightingale, and it's based on a song that became popular in England at about the time the Scrooby congregation settled in Leiden. So here's a bit of the English Nightingale.
so some more birds for you there. <laughs> so while Leiden was good for the scurvy settlers in many ways, and it allowed them to practice their religion free from retaliation, by 1618, many people in the community were starting to worry that maybe Holland wasn't the best place for them after all. There were a few reasons for this. Dutch law allowed foreigners only a limited range of jobs, most of which were unskilled or low-skilled manual labor. The majority of the scurvy men works in textile mills, tanneries, and other factory operations, which was a far cry from their training as Nottinghamshire farmers. And in the old story of immigrant populations everywhere, the English began to be concerned that their cultural identity was being lost. Their children were growing up speaking Dutch, some members of the group had married foreigners, and ironically enough, even though Dutch liberalism was what facilitated their religious freedom, they often looked down on the Dutch as being too liberal in their dress and manners. There was also legitimate concern that after the expiration of a 15-year truce signed in 1609, the long Dutch War of Independence against the Spanish would resume. And worries about this range from the collapse of the economy if the war resumed to the ultimate fear, which was the reconquest of Holland by Spain, which would leave Protestants like the Scrooby congregation to the tender mercies of the Inquisition. So faced with these fears, they decided to appeal to the London Corporation and sank almost all their meager community savings into hiring two ships destined for the New World, which um, you'll hear more about in a moment. In the end, only 35 members of the congregation were able to depart for New England, with the rest staying behind in the hopes of eventually being able to join their friends and family. Some of them, like Pastor John Robinson himself, never made it to the New World, and some of their descendants live in Leiden to this day. On the day of departure for the New World, Robinson held a long and emotional church service. Um, we have records of this in uh, in his writings, which also served as a final chance for the community to bid farewell to family members and to friends that they might never see again. While we were researching music in the Netherlands during this era, we found a theater song written in the 16 teens by the Dutch poet and play, play, playwright, excuse me, Brederel, Nu dobert my liefje op de rij, or Now My Love's Leaving on the Waves. Well, it's unlikely that any of the congregation were familiar with this song, since the separatists were not generally theater goers. Um, we imagine that they would have empathized with the story of emigration portrayed in this ballad. And here's a short excerpt. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Mayflower. The ship you see here is actually the Mayflower II. It's a replica, and it's beautifully restored and has just returned to Plymouth last month. Now, imagine this ship departing for the New World, sailing abreast with her sister ship named Speedwell, cutting through the Atlantic foam with plenty of provisions on board. Among the passengers on this journey are 40 separatists looking forward to their new colony. Now stop imagining that because it didn't happen that way. They wanted to leave in July 1620 from Southampton and arrive in early October. And there were two ships, the Mayflower and the Speedwell. The ironically named Speedwell had sprung a leak leaving Southampton, causing them to turn around 
and dock at Dartmouth. Repairs were then made. From Dartmouth, they set sail, getting about 200 miles beyond the southwestern tip of England, when the speedwell sprang another leak. They again turned around, this time anchored at Plymouth, the original Plymouth, not the one they're going to. While there, it was decided to abandon the speedwell altogether and pack everyone and everything into the Mayflower. By this time, it's, in, it's September, and they set sail again. By November, they anchored at Provincetown Harbor. Three expeditions around the harbor later, they decide to settle in an area the natives called Patuxet. They renamed it Plymouth, presumably after the English port from which they had last set sail. By this time, winter was setting in, and it would be literally fruitless to do any planting. So they waited out the winter on the ship. During this time, 45 of the 102 passengers died from illness. Finally, in March of 1621, eight months after they left, they came ashore to get down to business. So the journey was difficult. And on our recording, we try to portray the gravity of the situation in one of our spoken diary entries. But musically, we wanted to portray the levity that may have accompanied the hardship. So let's hear some of that. The next piece you'll hear is entitled, We Be Three Poor Mariners, published in England in 1609 by Thomas Ravenscroft. We be three poor Disdain, but we care for those merchant men which do our estates maintain. To them we dance this round, around the round, and to them we dance this round, around the round. And he that is as a bully boy, boy come, come pledge me on the ground, the ground, the ground. Well, we're now in the fall of 1621. The colonists didn't call their harvest celebration that year a Thanksgiving. They had had the good fortune of encountering Wampanoag natives who were friendly and who even spoke English, a couple of them, who were willing to help and make alliances with them and yes, celebrate a harvest with them. But that harvest feast most likely took place in September, probably right around now, when the harvest comes in, not in late November, which isn't good for harvesting very much, at least not in Massachusetts. Uh, by contrast to them, a day of Thanksgiving was a day of fasting, ironically, and giving thanks to God, which did happen a number of times, um, perhaps most notably in the summer of 1623, at the end of a long drought, when another ship arrived bearing much needed supplies. But the holiday that we now call Thanksgiving only uh, came to be celebrated in November during the Civil War under President Lincoln. These early peace treaties with the local tribes helped to ensure Plymouth's safety and were also a source of revenue from fur trading, which allowed them to start to pay their debts back to the Merchant Adventurers Corporation that had funded the colony. It's worth noting that the settlers were already in debt before they ever left England. And over the next several years, more people joined them, some from the congregation back in Leiden, which reunited some of those families that had been split up, but not all of them, and others from England, although not necessarily more separatists. By 1630, the town had about 300 people living there. 
We know of three music books that are listed in an inventory of William Brewster's possessions that, were take, that was taken in 1644. One was a copy of Henry Ainsworth's Psalter, uh, a book of psalm texts and tunes that had been published in Holland in 1612 specifically for the separatist congregations living there at the time. The second book was the Psalms of David in settings for voices and instruments by Richard Allison. And the third was called The Golden Garland, a collection of broadside ballads that were to be sung to popular tunes of the time. So we think it's highly likely that the English settlers would have known this next piece that we're going to listen to. This is the 100th Psalm, and we're going to hear it in two settings. First, a verse in the perhaps familiar tune from the Ainsworth Psalter, which we sing in unison like the separatists would have at church. And we'll follow that by two more verses in four-part harmony in a setting by John Dowland from around the same time. So here's Psalm 100. was probably familiar to some of you. When I hear us sing that, all I can hear is how sick I was when we recorded it. So I like to think I'm being historically informed because some of the settlers were probably sick at the time too. We tend to think of the pilgrims as a dour lot, but that's not true. Remember, these aren't Puritans we're talking about, and even that stereotype of the Puritan dressed in somber black with buckles on his shoes, who shuns dancing and drinking, uh, is not entirely correct, and it belongs to a different group of people at a later time anyway. We also have to remember that the separatists were only half the people who sailed on the Mayflower. The rest were Church of England, Dutch Reformed, some devout and some not at all, and everyone must have been used to their own forms of recreation wherever they came from. Now, while it's true that worship did last most of the day on Sundays, and everyone, separatist or not, was required to attend, and although their work as farmers and fishermen must have been never-ending, they certainly found time to sing or whistle, sport, even dance on occasion, although co-ed dancing was not allowed. So next up, here's our take on the beloved English country dance tune, Half Hannikin, which was printed in 1651, but was almost certainly known decades before that time. So we like to envision the Plymouth colonists dancing to it after, or maybe during a long day's work, Half Hannikin.
So one of the most intriguing discoveries while putting this program together was the book A New English Canaan by Thomas Morton. It was published in 1637. It is the earliest comprehensive description of native peoples in Massachusetts. Thomas Morton arrived in the Plymouth Colony in 1622. He was a lawyer, a businessman, and most importantly, a non-separatist. He was traveling for business reasons only. Morton saw fit to trade and socialize with the natives. These very activities were frowned upon by the precise separatists. To make matters worse, it was known to Governor Bradford that other pil and other pilgrim brass that Morton saw the natives as more civilized than they were. That's possibly the most insulting thing one could do against godly folk. Morton's affections for the natives went beyond mere business dealings. So after a falling out with his business partner, a certain Captain Wollaston, Morton took control of his own colony. He declared himself the host and christened the colony Marymount. As host, Morton entertained his native friends. In Book 3, Chapter 14 of New English Canaan, it contains a section entitled, Of the Revels of New Canaan. In it, Morton describes how the native inhabitants of Marymount, quote, did devise amongst themselves to have it performed in a solemn manner with revels and merriment after the old English custom, they prepared to set up a maypole upon the festival day of Philip and Jacob, and therefore brewed a barrel of excellent beer. Morton composed a song to accompany the maypole dancing. The verses were to be sung by the host, which we assume was Thomas Morton himself, while he distributes liquor to the revelers, who in turn lustily sing back a refrain. So to bring these gambles to life, I stitched together tunes from the English country dance tradition and fit Morton's words to it. And here we have, Drink and Be Merry.
was all. Plymouth continued to face economic hardship in its first decade, but after all those deaths of the first winter, the colonists remained relatively healthy. In the 1630s, Plymouth established a lucrative cattle trade with Massachusetts Bay Colony to the north. That's where the Puritans were. Agriculture did fairly well, and they started to send fish and furs back to England to pay off their debts. William Bradford's chronicle of Plymouth Plantation ends in 1650, as does our concert program. But before we move to some questions, just a couple of things. I first want to thank Massachusetts Historical Society for having us, Gavin and Sarah, for all their help with this evening's presentation. And I also want to give a shout out to our other band member, Josh Schreiber Shalem, who is playing and singing You Heard earlier. I also want to add that as musicians, our particular focus on 17th century English music is certainly not meant to ignore the other side of the story. I think most of us know that relations between native peoples and European settlers have a very complex history um, that continues into the present day. And I would encourage all of us to read more about the native side of the story, native history and present day culture. Um, so that we can make sure that their story is heard as well. Um, I've actually compiled some links for anyone who wants more information about that and several other topics, which will be sent to you after, uh, after the webinar ends this evening. So if you want to learn more about Wampanoag culture um, or anything else about early New England, the Mayflower anniversary and all the events surrounding it, um, you're welcome to to read more. And uh, he'll also share our website where you can find this album, Pilgrim's Progress, for sale. We have lots of copies and we'd love for you to have one. So um, please feel free to get in touch. And I think that wraps up our, our presentation this evening. So I think we can move to some questions. Great. Oh, thank you very much, Karen and Dan and, and Matt. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, unfortunately, there's, well, not unfortunately, but there's around 160 something people on, so we probably won't get to every single question, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Jerry wrote, uh, do we know whether uh, any of the pilgrims were experienced musicians in Europe? Um, also, are there records of musical performances in Plymouth? I, as much as I've read, I don't think we have a record of anyone um, who, who already was a professional musician. Um, at the time, you know, it was being a professional musician sort of entailed different things. You could be hired by the court, um, or I suppose you could, you know, run around London and play at the theaters and maybe teach somebody and, and sort of cobble it together. But I, I feel like from my knowledge, it's fairly unlikely that anyone from a group of farmers in Scrooby was making their living as a musician, um, which is not to say that nobody sang or played an instrument. We, we certainly have to assume i mean i would like to assume that that they were familiar with music and maybe somebody had a bass file or had a, a recorder or something that they brought along yeah um, we do have that in the, in the manifest of the uh, of the cargo and the mayflower we still have the cargo manifest for the mayflower and one of the items that's included the only specific musical item is a bass viola de gamba a bass file so somebody brought that along yeah but we don't know whose it is and yes. we also have to remember um that most of them, not all, um, but most of these people weren't literate. So it's not like they could just write down, oh, I brought my recorder with me. We, we have no way of, of having that record. So I'm, I'm afraid the answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay. But the good um, is that there, there were some, like Ed Winslow was educated. So there were other people in that orbit yeah. that would have had the standard Renaissance education. So they probably would have been musicians. But yeah. like, like Karen said, we don't know. Uh, so Lee wrote, um, how do we know what the singing sounded like then? Uh, you sing with parts, et cetera. Is uh, it educated guessing? And do you want to take that? Um, I guess in the sense, I mean, there's the question of how the language is pronounced. And again, we've sort of had to agree on a kind of house style for original pronunciation because just as today, there's a tremendous amount of regional variation in dialects and sounds of the language. Um, in terms of seeing the parts, anytime that we are singing um, in parts, that is actually from written printed music sources. So we do know, in fact, that they sang those songs with those notes. 
um, and that includes the psalm at the beginning. Um, we know one particular thing about their religious practice, um, specifically music related to religious practice, which is that the separatists did not believe in instruments in the um, church service, and they did not believe in singing in harmony. They felt that either of those things were too distracting from the most important thing, of course, which was worshiping God. So while there was singing, it was mostly psalms, and they all would have sung in unison, not in parts. Um, so we do know that. Great, thank you. So William wrote, um, what is the, well, I guess he said, what is the meaning of seven times salt? But I guess he would be asking uh, how you chose your name. Um, and also, uh, how did you get interested in this early music? Well, the, I guess the answer to the first question is a little more straightforward. Seven times salt is actually a quote from Hamlet, actually going back to Shakespeare once more, um, from the scene where Laertes returns home and sees that Ophelia has gone mad. He says, tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye, which sounds very dour and grim, and we're really not that <laughs> not that grim, but we liked the reference to Shakespearean music of the time, and Seven Times Salt just seemed like a good band name. Um, it was, you know, suggested by a friend, so that's how we got to be Seven Times Salt. Um, and how we got into this historical performance, we actually all met at the Longy School of Music, which is now the Longy School of Music of Bard College, um, in the early music program. Um, I think we all came at it from slightly different directions. I was a modern violin major as an undergrad and got interested, actually I've, I've been interested in Renaissance music for quite a long time. And so once I discovered that there were these older styles of instruments and different ways of making music, uh, I was totally on board and I went and got my master's degree at Longy and I've been doing early music ever since. Um, I think the other guys have maybe slightly different stories. Well, Matt was the one who sort of brought us together. We actually, our first public performance um, was on his master's recital um, at the Longy School of Music. Uh, he put the group together for that purpose. Um, it was, well, I, I, Matt, I don't think you intended it to be a one-off. We thought it was going to be a one-off. I think you, you, were, you were plotting already. No, I had every intention of having this go on forever. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it. Great. Um, Matt or Dan, did you want to talk at all about, um, or Matt, uh, your interest in how you became interested in this? I, I mean, I had a standard classical guitar uh, education that uh, in the beginning you always play Renaissance lute pieces. I just really just thought that was the finest music ever written by, you know, human beings. Um, that was the practical side. The other side was it just fired my imagination. You know, the, the, the courts, the kings, the queens, you know. The, uh, the magic of it all was irresistible, still is. Um, so Avery wrote, uh, I, read that Purit I read that Puritan churches featured rote singing, where everyone would choose their own key and tempo to sing to, uh, producing a, quote, horrid medley of confused and disorderly noises. How true is that really? Uh, that sounds horrible. Sounds like our rehearsals, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I really don't know. I haven't made much study of Puritans, um, and if that person uh, remembers what we were saying earlier, that separatists are different from Puritans, and so um, this concert program actually has nothing to do with Puritans um, per se, so I'm afraid I don't really know much about that practice, but um, it reminds me of another historical bit. Dan, what is the thing about, something about fifes in all different keys, and they yeah. would just like, play them all at the same time. Well, this has nothing to do with Plym Plymouth, but there, there's, an, there's a fairly well-attested anecdote that George Washington, when he first took control of the, the Continental Army, actually, this was when, when he first, uh, this was right, right here in Cambridge, um, and they were supposedly mustered on Cambridge Common, a lot of the uh, Massachusetts volunteer uh, forces and General Washington came up to inspect them and I don't think they knew what to expect with this you know this guy from Virginia who was not a New Englander and um, but he was he was uh, an enthusiastic amateur musician um, George Washington had the reputation of being a good singer and a good dancer and uh, they had a fife and drum corps but the fifes were in all different keys at all different pitches and yet they were playing together at the same time and one of the first orders that Washington gave when he took command of the Massachusetts uh, regiment 
regimen was that all the fifes should be sorted and collected according to their proper pitch and key, and that uh, only ones that were in the same key should be played together. <laughs> So, um, uh, to, just to wrap that up, it's um, the question of Puritans singing, you know, in different communities. It's, it's definitely something uh, that sounds interesting, and I would want to find out more. So, I'm sorry I don't know about that. Well, I, I love the anecdote about George Washington, and I think you know when you're Can you, just you, imagine know, you have to prioritize to your <laughs> <laughs> keep your priorities straight. Yes, that's right. Uh, so, uh, Ron wrote. Uh, which is, I think, probably a difficult question, but he said, uh, do we know anything about the music of the Native Americans uh, that these colonists encountered? The only um, tidbit, unfortunately, that I know uh, about uh, an interaction at the time, I, I can't remember if it's from William Bradford's writings or not, I think so, um, but he describes in how one of their early meetings, the uh, the English had a trumpet and a drum. So actually, I guess those are two more instruments that must have been on board the Mayflower, um, because it's documented. They had a trumpet and drum and that the Wampanoags were were amazed at the sound. Um, and I forget the rest of the description, but it sounds like, you know, this was just a completely new experience for them hearing some sort of trumpet and drum being played loudly. Um, unfortunately, I don't know anything really about the Wampanoag music and dance of the time. Um, I am happy to say that the, the living Wampanoag do, um, you know, still celebrate their culture. There are powwows with dancing and singing, people playing instruments. Um, I have not been lucky enough to go to one, but there are definitely people who continue that tradition, which makes me really happy. Um, so the resources are out there to find out more. Um, unfortunately, I'm probably not the person <laughs> to answer the question, but it's a good question. Um, so I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, and uh, Sarah wrote, can you comment on how the music was taught or passed down? Uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things. Um, and there it's, it's a, actually a complicated question, um, which, we, which we could do a whole presentation on, but uh, we'll try and keep the short version. The answer is that there wasn't one consistent way, certainly for dance musicians, as Karen said, most of the people who would have been playing for dancing, um, that sort of thing, were probably not literate, either musically or in terms of letters. Um, and they would have learned by ear um, as part of an oral tradition, um, the same way that a lot of folk musicians learn today. Um, as far as the more educated musicians, the people like Winslow, there were um, choir schools. Um, and a lot of times kids spent time in the English choir schools, young men particularly, because it was considered part of their development. And Thomas Morley, who wrote this book of concert lessons, also wrote a wonderful book called A Plain and Easy Introduction to Practical Music, um, which he published in 1599. And that was, uh, it was intended to be exactly that, to be a primer for someone who was educated, someone who could read in the basics of music as they understood it then in the late Renaissance. Um, it's a fascinating book. There are scans of it online. Um, and if you want to read through it, it's a, it's a great way to understand, how, in fact, how music would have been taught at least to educated upper class people um, during in, in the 1590s and early 1600s. I can say from my own experience working in the recreated village at Plymouth Plantation, you know, I had just come from, I guess, a typical conservatory training and I thought all music has to be learned from the page, right? You, you write notation on the page and that's how you learn it. And suddenly I was here just picking up songs by ear, which I hadn't had a chance to do before. And so it just, it was amazing making that connection of, oh, that's how you learn music. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you can read or not, you you listen to someone sing it and then you sing it. And so I thought that was a pretty nice, you know, callback to what probably happened for a lot of people 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, I, I just wanted to thank you um, all for joining us and uh, for the, the you know, amazing musical performance, as well as all of the history. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were going to share some of the uh, links that people that you mentioned, uh, both to your website, uh, so people can buy a copy of your CD, um, as well as some additional information. Um, and we will send all of this out um, with our thank you email as well. So um, if you don't have to scribble it down right now, but just to know that it's there. Um, and then 
finally, I would just say, uh, I hope you enjoyed the program um, and I hope that people will enjoy um, future programs and will consider supporting uh, MHS's work to bring all these programs uh, to audiences across the country. So thank you all and I hope everyone has a, has a wonderful night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.